Run for the Show podcast. Hi guys, welcome to episode 17 of Drum for the Song podcast. I am your host, Dane Campbell. Today, my special guest is the amazing Ashley Green from the post-hardcore band Holding Absence. Uh, they're a really great British band. Um, they have a new album coming out very soon, and I think you're going to love it. So uh, we had a nice chat together. I'd never really met him properly before, so it was really cool to catch up um, after chatting t- together on Instagram and stuff like that. But um, yeah, great drummer, great band, lots of cool things to say. So let's just get straight to the interview. Run for the show podcast. Hey, everybody. Today I'm with the amazing Ashley Green. And he's a ba- in a band called Holding Absence. And they are absolutely amazing. You need to check them out, whether it's your kind of thing or not. Um, they're going to be, well, I think they're going to be really big. They're pretty big anyway. <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah, check them out. Um, I, gl- I guess, Ashley, would you agree you, you get classed in this world of post-hardcore, which is, I guess, one of these genres that consists of quite a wide variety of bands. Would, would you agree that's correct? Yeah, man, I think we get, um, like, Holden Absence does get, um, I don't want to say pigeonholed because I feel like post hardcore is definitely the right, um, I guess like genre, but, um, you know, through the years we've, uh, I guess as musicians, we've been like, oh, well, it's kind of post hardcore, but it's kind of, you know, like, I guess alternative. And there's all these like different genres, I guess, floating around that we've like, di- you know, dipped into, I guess, um, uh, if people haven't heard our first single from our new record, a song called Beyond Belief, uh, which is very like uh, The Cure inspired and influenced. It's really like in that vein of almost like if The Cure were a 2020s rock band. Yeah. Um, and then the single that came after that, uh, Afterlife, uh, is almost, you know, a bar for bar, like a post hardcore, like Rager or whatever. Um <laughs> So yeah, it's 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 a funny like kind of kind of niche to 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 try and like pinpoint where the band is um, in terms of genre. But I think like yeah, it's I don't know like pushing that boundary of of post hardcore and and you know expanding the genre. I guess has always been like one of the fundamentals of the band and and how we like approach how you know our our music but yeah post hardcore is kind of like the the easy kind of like yeah we're we're this you know we're a post hardcore band yeah give people a starting point and i always think it's great to try and push the boundaries and to to maybe borrow things from other genres just to at the end of the day you've got your own unique sound and i think that's obviously gonna help compare yeah thank you you know yeah definitely and i think you always have had that um that hold in absence sound i'm a little bit out of the loop with maybe a kind of other bands you're surrounded with these days whereas 10 years ago i probably would have known all about them but um i guess because I, I i've known some of you guys and lucas and scott for years and years i suppose i'm a bit more um familiar what you guys are doing and stuff like that because we're all friends mm-hmm. online and yeah and i i think I've, I've only got to see you once sadly it was in um what was that festival in Oh, was it Bristol or Nottingham or somewhere? Oh, I can't remember. We did. I I went to see you somewhere. It was one of them festivals where there's different uh, venues. Not um, um not Mac- not Macmillan Festival. No, it wasn't that. No, um, different venues in a city centre. I think it was Bristol and Straight Lines were playing, and then you were playing oh, a few hours um, after us. Fat Fat Lip Festival. In, oh, yeah. That was in that was in Bristol. We played yeah. at um we played at the Lanes. It was like there was the venue called the Lanes, and then SWX. And I think it was like those two, two, and then there's like an acoustic venue sort of outside in in the lanes. That, that sounds. I think that was it. Yeah, I think that. Was yeah, it. and that, that was probably one of the last straight lines gigs we did, which is <laughs> saying something. But yeah, that was the only time I got to see you, and it was amazing, and it was rammed, and it was great. They experienced the live show. Obviously, you've done a lot since then. Um, yeah, man, I think yeah. that was before you, the the full album came out. I think that was way before the debut album came out. So, um, I've obviously heard that. And I listened to it loads when it came out. So congratulations, because it, it's awesome. Thanks, um, Thanks, mate. Thank you. Drumming's really good on it. And like I, what I, what I was talking, I was talking to my wife about it the other day. 
we were just we were listening to Blink One Eight Two, right? We both loved them <laughs> since we were kids. Um, and I was like, do you listen? Do you actually pay attention to Travis's drummer drumming, or do you just listen to the song? And it just mm-hmm. made me think: Do some people listen to Blink One Eight Two and only think of like the song? To, and because I'm a drummer, I'm like. I'm listening to the song, but I'm also listening to his drum parts and, and like how it all fits in. And she was like, I've never thought about it, but yeah, I guess I do mm. associate it with like, oh yeah, all those drummy bits. I guess she couldn't go too technical, but yeah, I think I, well, I don't know why I brought that up, but I just thought I've listened to Holding Absence and I always listen to the drumming as well. So I guess some people who um, play drums maybe don't do that, but yeah, it's banging. So, um, oh, thanks, man. Yeah, that's good. That like that comparison, like the um, obviously the name of the podcast, "Drum for the Song." I feel like Travis is like, I'm not really a big Blink fan. Like, right. I feel like you know, in um, when I first got into music, for me, it was like Green Day, and I feel like there were those two people that are either like you like Blink or you like Green Day, and yeah. Green Day were like the one for me but um That's cool. i remember remember talking to uh it was maybe lucas or, or scott it, it might have been somebody else but um uh we, we were we were talking like and the perfect like travis is the perfect drummer because he like he's really in the song like he's proper like he he is there for the song he's serving the song but also enhances the songs by like creating i guess like drum hooks you know yes so like that like and he he's almost like that perfect um i feel like anyways he's one of the sort of better known drummers for that and like you know for someone like you know my partner or your wife who are like oh yeah i don't really like listen to the drum parts for like me and you we're like we're listening for that pocket but then also when they do the cool stuff and then you know those other people in you know your wife my partner and they're like i really like that part that he does there that's like oh that's like you know the the hook almost like in um songs like um like smells like teen spirit is i like the intro is like a drum intro and is iconic as hell but like no one would have ever predicted glance and glance and glance and glance bow would be like so like it is like the is probably one of the most famous drum hooks in rock music like in yeah. in the history of it you know so it's like yeah i feel like travis was you know again like a, a perfect example i can't like think of anything off the top of my head but you know blink albums and blink songs are just rammed full of these like drum hooks which also serve the song like yeah you know perfectly i think yeah but like he has that fine balance of playing clever drum parts and i i feel as if sometimes the parts of the songs are probably started with the drums and then they build on mm. after the, his parts maybe but yeah without kind of overplaying even though he's a very busy drummer yeah you no know, he doesn't like get in the way of vocals and stuff like that he doesn't just kind of do massive fills in the middle of verses and stuff i think he's got that perfect balance um he's way busier than how i would play but yeah I, maybe i would if i could play like him i would play more i don't know but, yeah um, yeah but cool that's i like okay i was a blink guy you were a green day guy i was yeah, a, man, yeah. i was kind of like i listened to green day and i was like i remember someone sent me dookie for the first time i was like oh yeah really good songs but i'm just like it doesn't quite hit me um, and I guess it wasn't as ent- it wasn't like entertaining. Like uh, part of the reason I liked Blink was because it was funny. And at the end of the day, yeah. I was probably like fifteen years old at that point. I uh, fourteen maybe. I don't know. And you know, I, and I guess they've they've matured a lot since then. And so have I. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Maybe in like maybe in those like I accept, yeah again like because I don't really know Blink. Like I feel like they were more like the farty band. Like yeah. they had song names about like, you know, farts and stuff. Whereas Green Day were a bit more maybe like ah uh, like stick it to the man, like a, b- a bit more in that like punky sort of rock, I guess. Like they took that avenue and and Blink took the more like ah uh, we're just like almost virgin on like pop punk where and like you can probably see from there how that genre like really grew into its own and like bands like that took from blink like yeah i feel like yeah no, no i yeah. totally i totally agree with you so um let's start with um like your journey then we talked about green day but how did you get into drumming and how old were you and stuff like that and who who, who influenced you the most uh so that's like a very like big box i guess to unpack so i i started playing drums 
um, when I first started secondary school, I was about 11, 12 years old. Um, and I would like stay after school, maybe three, four days a week um, for an hour and play the drum kit in, in secondary school. Um, like a really, like maybe like a session pro, or like a PV drum kit. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I was just like infatuated with like this instrument, with like the instrument. I was like, this is so cool. Like it's, it's like the loudest thing I'd ever heard. And I was just like, I love this. Like, this is so, so like, just, just cool, you know? And I remember this would have been, um, 2004, um, the same, yeah, that, that year I, uh, went to HMV sort of after my birthday and I'd got some birthday money. I was like, right, I'm going to buy a CD. Um, and I had enough money to buy two CDs. So, and so, so I bought the American idiot album and I also bought the live, um, Slipknot record, like not, um, live 9.0. Oh, cool. Um, and I had like a, I had a little red CD player, uh, that ha- was like, you could, you could like carry essentially. Um, and I would like take that to school with those two records and like try and play to those records in the drum room until, uh, the year after my parents bought me a drum kit. Um, they got me lessons for like three or four years, um, which was probably like the biggest part of how I picked up, um, a lot of how I approach music now with like theory and I guess like tempo and, and, you know, how I look at music as like a, a musician, if I can, if I call myself that. Yeah, Um, you're definitely a musician. uh, (laughs) (laughs) I know we drummers um, sometimes get categorized as non-musicians, but I think we are. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah, man, that was like, that's the, I guess the, the, the most sweet, sweetest, shortest version of that story. I think I was I was introduced to drums uh, from like walking around. So I'm like from a really small village um, in the middle of England, um, a place called Wollaston uh, in Northamptonshire. It's where like the first Doc Martin factory was like ever built or something, oh, which is like okay. the like the coolest thing to ever come out of that little place. But um, but yeah, I remember we were walking. Me and my mum and my little sister we were walking around the village. And uh, we could hear like someone in that there was like a house somewhere and, and someone was playing drums in the house. And I was like, oh, wow, what's that? That sounds wild. I was like, what, what is that? You know? Um, and then, yeah, I found out that it was like, it was this drum kit. And um, I was just like, yeah, I want to, I want to do that. And, you know, even like, I, I kind of talk about it in, in frequently, but sometimes I'll like talk about it. And then I'm like, bloody hell, God, imagine if I hadn't have been like, yeah, I want to do I want to do that and and throughout all the years of me doing it because i'm you know 28 now so i've been doing this for 17 years and wow. way more than half of my life um it's so weird that if you know any of the sort of things that i'd have done sort of leading up to this um i guess you know leading up to today or or things past like i was always like yes to most things you know I've, i'm such a like like a say yes and then figure out how to do it later kind of person like i don't really ever that's good yes yeah but yeah man yeah yeah that's like the how i got into it i guess cool and then um like in terms of being in a band learning how to be in a band were you in any bands before you joined holding absence yeah yeah like a a couple um i was in like a, a school sort of band which was like a good bit of fun um we covered like Linkin Park and Kings of Leon and Metallica yeah. and like all the, you know, all the like cool songs that would come on Kerrang. And we'd be like, oh, this doesn't sound hard enough that I wouldn't be able to play it, but it's still like cool enough where it's like, you know, a cool song to play. I think we we did, um, this is creasing. We played like a, a, a talent show, like in the school and we played the intro to Master of Puppets into Molly's Chambers by Kings of Leon. Oh, what? <laughs> it's just like, I know, I That's don't know crazy. How, how we did it. I have no idea, but I just remember like, yeah, we, we did that. And like, <laughs> like just weird, stupid little things like that. Um, And then, yeah, from there, like, ended up meeting a lot of uh this was like around the time where like join my band.com was like a big thing um met like musicians in the sort of the area of northamptonshire and um three of my like now longest friends um a couple guy couple guys sorry called sean adam and jordan 
we ended up forming a band in I think maybe 2008 maybe 2009 um and we we wrote like a couple songs that are hidden away sort of in the darks of of YouTube just just sort of stores you know I sometimes go back to and I'm like god bloody hell like we were that you know that was heavily influenced by bands like Bullet around the time that they had released Fever um Avenged Sevenfold Trivium Atreyu you know all those like kind of cool I guess like metal but rock bands yeah um uh yeah when and then when I moved to uni, I joined more of like a a noisy sort of, I guess, punky, but a little bit math influenced um, band called uh, We Left Them For Dead, which I was like, which was sort of the biggest um, sort of learning curve as to being in a band for me. I think our vocalist, Dan, was very like, he'd been in um, a couple bands before um a band called two shot blast who are from from leicester and uh yeah we'd you know i was the youngest member of this band i was like 20 maybe 24 maybe maybe less maybe i was like 22 and you know dan the vocalist he was like 30 and had a daughter and you know these were quite like older guys but just seeing you know that it was like wow i'm i'm you know almost 10 years younger than these guys and we're in this band and they've got the same drive and tenacity and you know they were we were really like regimented we'd we'd practiced two days a week and i would travel down from nottingham to leicester and it was great man it was really like um it was like they were sort of in that uh era of or or we guess like stuck and they were like oh we don't really know how to book shows now you know we haven't booked shows from way back when we used to call up places and be like, oh yeah, uh, we play some shows here. Hmm. And you know, me being like, oh, all you do now is you just go on like Facebook and message people and go, oh yeah, we play some shows here or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, that's, crazy. that's then through that band, I really got to meet Lucas and Scott and their old band Fallen With Style. We played a couple shows with them, uh, I think in like 2014, maybe 2015. Um, and then from there, uh, covered or, or sorry, Tom had, uh, Tom Pike had um, like fractured his wrist a couple couple nights before they were due up to go on a tour, and uh, Lucas called me up and was like, "Oh man, can you um come and fill in on this this ten day tour we're doing? It starts on Thursday. This was Saturday, wow. and I was like, I was just like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Went, you know, got all my stuff from Leicester, got the train down to Cardiff. We rehearsed for like." You know, that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, set off uh, the old bar fly in London that Thursday and then played the first show of tour. And um, yeah, man, I met Holden Absence on that tour in Cardiff, ended up uh, becoming really good friends with James. And then that January, we did our first tour together, like a little four day tour. And the, it was just like, yeah, it was just sort of um, there was no sort of oh my god I don't ever want to I don't want to not be in this band you know I then after after I finished uni moved to Cardiff and it's just been a constant sort of uphill since then man it's been great it's been like yeah one of the like most tiniest minute decisions where I was like oh yeah I'll come and yeah. fill in and I'll hold an absence tour for you like yeah fucking whatever like it's fine um to now almost being on the the cusp of of releasing a, a second album you know, along with a back catalogue of, you know, even having it, it feels so surreal to say that, God, I'm in a band that's recorded two albums and eight singles. You know, I've been on a split EP with like one of my favourite bands at the moment. And, you know, it's a real like, yeah, a real like humbling thing to be like, God, I'm, if I could, you know, if 10 year old me could look at where I am now, they'd be like, bloody hell <laughs> it's, a, it's a good job you said yeah can i have a drum kit for christmas that year you know <laughs> yeah yeah exactly what, what, what leads to something else down the line you like it's so important these little tiny decisions yeah and, you know even things that might happen in the future you've got to mm. make them but yeah if you say yes to everything that's always generally a good sign because you're going to have more opportunities that way but um yeah yeah really, man like the other th- the other things i noticed like you, you won a cardiff music award Mm. That, that was pretty big deal i don't have one of those <laughs> yeah that that was um i think that was 2000 and 
think it was 2018 if yeah. i'm if i'm not wrong uh yeah i think that was um for like maybe it was best newcomer band i'm not i, I couldn't i can't yeah, remember off the top uh, of my head break, but um through act or something like that yeah 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 that's it yeah um it's pretty cool man. yeah that was that was crazy because you know i i think um so i obviously you know i'm not from um cardiff i'm not from south wales i no. essentially moved you know i only really moved there four years ago now so i'm quite like a quite a newbie to that like whole scene in that world but you know at the time james and lucas had grown up in you know going to shows at fuel going to shows at the green room um you go into you know these shows in south wales that you know they'd put on themselves in their in their prior bands and and seeing that like I guess the alternative scene in Cardiff grow and go from, you know, lows where there weren't many bands and highs when there were like lots of bands doing things, you know, in the days of like falling with style. And I think um, like award, like I guess ceremonies and, and little things like that can be, I guess a little, they, they had said, you know, a little bit clicky, you know, we were the only band sort of on that bill that we knew, you know, we didn't really know any of the other bands that were playing. It was lots of bands that, um, you know, we could, we didn't really know, we didn't really know the people in those bands. So it was yeah. kind of like, oh, you know, almost like being back in school where you're the, you're the, you're the little group of, you know, like rocker kids with the, uh, with the CD players and the headphones in, just like, oh, all right, everyone, don't mind us. <laughs> and then having to, having to get up and be like, well, oh, right, we don't know any of you, but we're the, we're the rockers. Like, <laughs> yeah, because it <laughs> was there. Uh, I, I know what you mean about, I've heard, I've never been to one of those awards, but I have heard mm. a little bit clicky and there's like a lot of Welsh language stuff or that kind of, uh, you know, I, I want to say indie, but like artsy mm. kind of vibe, isn't it? So yeah, it was great to see a rock band win something. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> so I, think, I think, yeah, I think um, that's probably again, like a, a testament to, I guess, not just us as the band, but the people that support us and, yeah. you know, the, the people that have been there for, for like Lucas and James in their prior bands coming into this and, you know, how good are people they are where, you know, people want to support them in every sort of avenue that they want to, you know, prosper in. But then mm. also, you know, the people that came into supporting our bands from whether that was, you know, the earliest tours in 2016 or whether that was, you know, even the tour just before we'd gone to that like um the ceremony i guess you know the the award ceremony but yeah it's 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 as much as things like that are like ah oh, this is really nice for us to to i guess like win and, and you know be be given like oh you know best newcomer it's like god like you could i guess you can never really um that's never really a hundred percent the band it's always like I feel like it's definitely 50% of the people that support you, whether that's promoters or fans or, yeah. or, or whatever, as well as, you know, 50% the band and the people that you work with in the band, whether that's like video directors or producers, you know, like it's such a, such a nice thing to be like, God, we, you know, we all did this as like a, you know, like a big unit working for one thing, you know? Yeah, man. No, that's good. Um, Let's talk a little bit about your debut album. Obviously, we're going to try and mm. promote your new one, but um, did really well. I had loads of great reviews across the board, as far as I can see. I view it as great. Um, but one thing I thought was a bit interesting is that guitarist left the band during the recording of it. Mm -hmm. uh, like, how, like obviously, that's not very convenient for you. Um, how did you kind of? solve that issue and you know did it i presume it must have held you back a little bit and you know looking back yeah, it was, was it you know was it a good thing or i think it was it was definitely like a, a mixed bag of like you know in so the the guitarist in question faisal you know we me and him had been in the band since 2016 together and right we were really good good friends and um you know we'd, we'd wrote like a, a good portion of you know six singles before that five songs for the record you know we'd, we'd got like quite a quite a deep i guess history together as friends and and as like colleagues if, if you want to say that um but but yeah man I, I, he he had other he i guess the the nicest way to say he wasn't happy in the band and as 
not his colleagues as his friends it was like you know you don't you don't like you never want to see your friends unhappy so if you know if they can sort of come to that sort of i guess realization and say ah i'm not really happy you know writing for the band anymore the touring is great um but you know he could go and tour in another band and you know which would subsequently loathe which have obviously gone on to just like you know just I didn't blow up that. i didn't realize that that was cool oh that's cool because they're amazing as well i didn't realize yeah that, man that was his mm. band as well ah cool yeah so he he went on to to join loathe and for like the best like you know literally for the better we're probably even better friends now and you know seeing your friends succeed is almost as good as succeeding with your friends so so yeah it was it was definitely like a i guess going back to the album you know there was a a point where i guess me james and lucas were a little bit like god like we probably won't finish the record should we just put out the five songs that we've recorded and you know essentially like could you like call it you know there was definitely that conversation um but uh i think that same day we ended up uh sort of getting the bones and the structure down for what went on to be like a shadow um which i think is like one of our most played songs you know from from the album which is great um and again that was you know down to you know oh let's let's not like let thing you know let's not let that keep us downtrodden let's like we've got to like get through this like if we can't get through this like you know how how are we ever gonna i guess like you know because there's never an end goal for a band but you know i feel like releasing an album is sort of like a we could have stepped back after that record and gone we've we did it man we fucking did it you know um so yeah that was it was definitely like a the i guess like the muddiest trudgiest uh times of the the band but yeah we we had scott who is now in the band um kind of help us he he is the and he he helped us finish a song called to fall asleep and uh yeah like testament to to scott and lucas's working relationship you know i guess they'd like really crafted that over you know the 10 plus years that they'd been friends and been in a been in fallen with style together um they wrote that song like 10 minutes before they then left to come to a gig you know to come to a show in club mm-hmm. um and yeah like that that was sort of i guess the the cement for us then you know we'd we'd recorded the album in in two halves we'd recorded five songs with fez um and then we'd recorded and finished the latter half of the record with with scott um and it really felt like okay this is you know a a positive step in in the direction of i think we know where we're going now and then almost straight off the the back of that um we did a, a like off a, a big like album headline tour in the UK and then went and toured in Europe in April uh came back and then in May uh Lucas Scott and James all went to London and we were like co-writing with um a guy called Dan Weller who has produced our new record and the guys wrote Gravity Birdcage and Afterlife in that session nice um which yeah then you know we we released gravity and birdcage and afterlife has gone on to to this record so it was almost like having scott finish that record gave him that i guess like real fire to be like you know i, f- I feel like it, it helped us get so get the this new record done so i guess fast um he, he you know maybe he had this um inkling of oh, i've got something to prove here like let's let's write this second record asap and you know we'd then gone on to write and record it almost within the year that we'd released our first record which took us from you know 2000 and maybe 17 was when we had the first demo for a song for that record until 2019 so um so yeah like i think yeah going from from record 1 and record 2 there were definitely uh parts where we had uh i guess learnt how to approach a record going yeah. into you know another going into the second record but yeah you probably know like because you know if i i had a quick look at um 
fill in the suns and like had a, a quick look at the discography and you guys have released like quite a few albums so i guess you know you understand the uh, i don't know if if you um as soon as you've released something or finished something you're all already looking towards the next thing yeah i guess so um I think we've all like every band I've ever been in, it's always kind of been a quick turnaround, but maybe that's because I guess it depends on your touring schedule. I think if you end up literally being on the road constantly, you don't, it must be difficult to kind of write a new album. I guess we've always kind of had that balance of having enough time at home um, yeah. to crack on. Um, so yeah. So we released our second album next year, last year, sorry. Yeah. In the pandemic, but only because we originally were meant to have a, an, a you know, a tour, schedule um like we could have delayed it um i personally wanted to delay it myself but um you know it ended up being that and we'll just release it anyway but um yeah, yeah we, we we planned the right there you know pretty much as soon as we'd finished the lot the one before and um yeah i guess we haven't really looked that far in the future because we haven't played a gig yet with over the new stuff so maybe there might be a longer gap until the next one but that's going to be pretty standard i think <laughs> it's, it's crazy isn't it they're like yeah you know as as bands now like we're, we're having to be like right we'll release this now and we might get to play some of it yeah. <laughs> like, you know because even now we're we've started writing for whether it's a record or a couple singles after this record you know we're already like trying to trying to hone in on writing a third record and good yeah. you know it's it's kind of like god you know we we released a, so a song called birdcage you know as like with gravity last year i think we've played it l at like a live session once and we probably won't play it at a show which you know usually we will go through the like um rafters of of having i guess shows from maybe like march until november december time and we'll like weave that song in and out of set lists depending on on who we're playing with or where we're playing yeah. or how long we're playing for but like to think god we probably won't play birdcage now and and like it's so Crazy. it's mad like yes yeah. yeah, it's, it's such a such a weird kind of like thing that you know this this new this new world order has sort of <laughs> put bands in where it's like well you can release music but you know after a week people might forget about it yeah you they, know how do they, you keep people yeah, they, they, you, you, it's a, you're worried that they're going to just move on to something else because it's so easy yeah. to, you know, with obviously the streaming stuff. It's like, oh yeah, my mm. favorite band, my favorite band have released a new album. They'll probably listen to it to death for a couple of weeks, yeah. and then until the second favorite band releases another, another album. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but obviously touring does keep them interested, and obviously socially it helps people out mentally, traveling mm. and stuff. Yeah, but if you're not doing that, I, I guess I don't know. Well, your th thoughts are on the live streaming gigs. It's not something that we've done. Um, I know other bands are doing it in in the interim period now, but I don't know. If, is mm -hmm. there anything you guys have considered, or have you done anything like that yet? So, yeah, we've done. We've done. Um, so we did. If I'm not, I might be. I might be wrong. But we've done uh, like a heavy music awards uh, sort of show. I guess like live performance. We did three songs for that. Uh, we did five for five um, festival, which was like an online thing where um, a photographer, Tom Pullen had put together, you know, he did the first one, I think in, I want to say June last year. Okay. Um, and he, he had bands like Don Broco and Tushikari, you know, headlining. And it was, it was kind of like a fundraiser to raise um, money for, I believe a charity that was like working alongside the NHS and, um, and they raised like tens of thousands of pounds for this. Wow. You know, it was, it was huge. Yeah, yeah. Um, and around December time, they, you know, he said, oh, we're going to do another one. Do you guys want to play? Uh, and we were like, oh yeah, for sure, man. That'd be great. Like, you know, the, the first one was, su was for such a great cause. And, you know, it was, it was really great to like see all these, you know, bands like doing things like this and proper like DIY, you know, bands had filmed themselves on like their phones and stuff nice um we were like yeah yeah of course like you know then we started pulling in our you know we got beth to to film it for us and it was like, i edited the video scott mixed the audio you know it was kind of like our first go at oh this is like you know a real cool way to kind of like go back to those early days of doing everything yourself you know it was really cool 
Um, and uh, yeah, we've got like a quite like a, a grandiose idea to to do a a light like a few more streams between you know the album coming out and hopefully when we can tour again. Like we've got quite a lot sort of in the in the pipeline. I don't want to say like in the pipeline, but you know things that we're working on in terms of like live streaming where. Oh, you know we want to we want to do like an album release like show and um i guess like so i i personally think you know like live streaming could become sort of an extra thing for bands to to market sort of after a tour you know if if um for whatever i guess like the best example is you know if 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 you guys ended up touring the uk and you know, say it was either a, a headline tour or a support tour, and uh, you're able to get, you know, footage from each night of of songs, um, and put that together into like a video for your fans, um, and you you know put that together and you you stream that say on on Twitch or you know through a thing called Veeps. You know, people can buy tickets to that. Veeps take like, um, I think it's like a percentage of like a, what is like a service or like a ticket yeah, fee the same way like live nation and, and Ticketmaster and those places do um you essentially keep the money for the ticket and then whether you then pay those people that you know did the video and stuff for you or or you know you can have like exclusive merch tables on on the veeps things as well you know it's as well as serving the fans that went to those shows and you can be like let's have like a watch back you know together you can also you know get the people from elsewhere you know people say in america that you know want to see you guys yeah. in a show setting you can be like well here you go here's a, here's like you know a, a live like a, a show essentially you know like bands i think the some of the biggest ones we've like spoke about are bands like you know parkway drive who are you know this australian band that have probably metric tons of pyro packed into the back of a lorry and you know when they like headlined uh Vakan, um i think in 2019 maybe you know imagine being able to to monetize your headline set at a festival or, or you know like for example you guys playing at download you know buying that footage from download or whoever operates the the big cameras at download and being able to to say to your fans, oh, we're doing a big, you know, live stream. We're all going to be together as well. We'll all be in the chat and you can like chat with the band and, you yeah. know, ask questions and kind of, you know, hang out and stuff. I think that's like definitely something like a, a good thing, a positive thing that's going to come out of this four bands as like a kind of, I guess, lucrative as as for, for lack of a better term, business right. model could could be. Yeah, I I think that's definitely likely to be a way forward. And like you say, for like there's like we'll talk about your visa issue in a bit. Mm. Um, like we get requests, uh, oh, why, when are you coming to the states? It's like, well, at the moment, we know unless someone wants to give us a big arena tour supporting someone, we can't afford to do it, or or yeah. no one will be willing to book us for what we need to cover the cost. So it could be a way to at least you know, access those fans in those areas of the world where we can't physically tour mm. um, due to the financial restraints and stuff. Um, but yeah, um, you know, Australia is another one. Like, people yeah, say, like, yeah. Well, how, much, how much do you think it will cost us to, all of us <laughs> to come to Australia with a couple of techs? Yeah, like, yeah. And man. then it's just weird. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, um, and before this whole pandemic thing even started, like, I've mentioned it before a few times. I, I always thought like in the future, we're going to end up doing virtual reality gigs. Mm. But, um, I reckon that's going to be a thing. Um, e even if it like for, for various reasons, for similar reasons to that, but like also for like, well, if it becomes so, you know, too expensive, too bad for the environment for all these people to kind of travel. Um, yeah. It's just a way of, allowing touring to happen you could put, maybe still play a different show every night but like you know people would buy tickets to a certain night so it's kind of like there's a different show happening every night different actual performance yeah but, yeah but you're doing it from you know your recording studio or whatever i think that's yeah but like obviously the virtual reality element might heighten 
the actual experience a little bit more than just watching it on your, your telly or on your laptop or whatever. I think maybe yeah, that's, there's, there is a room for that maybe one day. Like I'm not even into the virtual reality gaming world. I know that's a thing and I know that's getting <laughs> bigger. It's not something I've really got into, but um, I certainly think once they get that kind of level of quality and interactivity where you might be able to feel the guy next to you and stuff like that, I think, you know, that's something that could happen in the next 20 um, years or so, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, fully. I think, <laughs> I think the, the technology is like 100% there. Like if you've yeah. ever like seen like um, music videos where you can like, you know, have your phone and you're like l- moving around the screen and like, you know, looking around at like, you know, those like 360 videos. Yeah, yeah. That, that tech is like definitely there. It's yeah. just a case of like someone you know some some bands being like oh like why have we just not done this yet let's do this you know yeah. and make like this fully immersive kind of experience for for fans you know like like long are the days where like you you could have big over the head headphones with wires every like everyone has a pair of bluetooth headphones now yeah. you know so like you don't even have to be confined to sitting down you know in your living room you could go you know outside sit on a sit in the park you know sit somewhere where it's nice and warm and do stuff like that like yeah. if, if you know you, if so be it that's what you wanted to do but <laughs> yeah man i think like yeah it's definitely like it just takes one band to kind of to look at the box and go god look at all this stuff in here this like with vr and all this stuff let's just do this do yeah. this mad thing you know hopefully some massive yeah. band will do it like bloody foo fighters or something one day oh yeah that would be cool yeah and then it'll, it'll, they'll lead the way for everyone else but um no that's cool man. it's good to hear your opinion on it um mm. i'm glad to hear you've had a bit of experience doing it um like oh, what i was going to we'll talk about your new album now um greatest mistake of my life it's coming out on the 16th of april guys so whoever's listening um it's out very soon so make sure you you check it out preferably buy it or at the very very least stream it um but i'm sure you guys get a lot of streams as well as, as purchases um but yeah what what number one what was it like when you recorded it where did you record it um was there a kind of difference obviously it was a different experience from the first album because you didn't have someone leave but you you have had someone leave the band since james yeah james your bassist has just left fairly recently mm-hmm. so um I'll get your opinion on that as well in in a bit. Um, but yeah, well, let's talk about the new album a little bit. What should people expect? Uh, expect. I think if if people haven't heard our band before, this is like such a grandiose, I guess, first listen for them. It's kind of everything we'd done before completely unhinged no holds barred dialed all the way to 11 you know nice. um i think you know without sounding too cliche and and too you know like i'm i'm saying the same thing everyone else has and being like you know it's the best material we've we've written i think it's some of the i guess for the more like drummy fellas that listen to the podcast like it's definitely the best sort of drum related or or sorry drum it's, it's like the best drumming i feel like I've, I've ever i've kind of like played it's some of the best performances you know captured um the songs are, are very from big soaring like epic songs to proper like just bangers to very emotional like um i don't want to say ballad is the right word but very like uh early i guess my chemical romance like hmm. paramore almost like the black parade in 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 influence songs you know there's there's this it's, it's a very big bag i feel like it's a it's definitely a, a journey from from when you first listen to the first song until the last song it's very like um i feel like it's it's probably our best kind of mission statement for this sort of period in our lives is not only musicians but as people um yeah it's very um it's very we're, we're very very proud of it is the is the most sort of oh. definitive thing i could say hi i hope you're enjoying this episode of drum for the song i just wanted to briefly interrupt the interview to tell you about my patreon page which is a place where you can support the podcast and of 
course, support myself. You can um, sign up to one of the three tiers on there. There's one that's three pounds a month, one that is five pounds a month, and one that is 10 pounds a month. There are loads and loads of exclusive benefits to signing up, including bonus episodes, merch discounts, Christmas card for myself. Um, if you sign up to the top tier, I'll send you a pair of my drumsticks. Um, loads of other stuff. So go check it out. It's patreon.com forward slash drum for the song. And um, another way you could support me if you're interested, if you're not bothered about the Patreon thing, if you go to my official website, drumforthesong.com, you can send a donation via PayPal. So, um, yeah, thanks for watching this and enjoy the rest of the show. Drum for the Song podcast. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's, it, was, it was great. We, we recorded it. Uh, we finished recording it, you know, at the time we were recording this podcast, almost we finished recording it a year ago to the day. Oh, wow. um, so we were at Middle Farm Studios, which is in the south of England. Um, we were there from for about five weeks from the beginning of February just until mid-March. Um, yeah, we recorded it with the producer, Dan Weller, who, you know, I'd previously mentioned we did a couple co-writes with and, you know, we'd had we'd, we'd worked with him quite a bit. and we were we were keen to to work with him on a on a full record and i think he he you know in the early stages he really brought out a, a part of us that maybe as band members you kind of get you kind of maybe internalize and you're like i shouldn't say that that sounds stupid and then you know with dan he'll he really brings that out of you where it's like anyone anyone got any cool ideas and you could be like oh i mean I was thinking this and he'll he'll be like oh god that's classic instantly like he's a, he's at like on the thing that you've suggested and it's like this is brilliant and you're just like god he, he really like i feel empowers you as a as a you know a musician um which like for five weeks in a studio you know is is such a a great feeling it was it was it was amazing um yeah we you know i i, I don't really know like how to best describe it other than like, it was probably like one of the best five weeks of my life. Nice. Like it was it's so, so good, man. And again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I think, you know, if, if 14 year old me who was playing in my mum and dad's conservatory could have seen, you know, 27 year old me recording the band that I'm in second album in a place like middle farm, you know, where I've seen other bands record. I've seen like band documentaries and bands talking about middle farm and, you know, I think every single day I was just like so grounded being like, God, I'm so lucky to be in this position, you know, recording, recording drums or recording cymbals with Dan and, and then making food for everyone in the evening and, you know, just yeah. hanging out, playing board games and stuff was, was really special, man. Yeah. And I think that sort of adds to the magic of the the record. Um, and it's just unfortunate that, you know, the week after we came out of this sort of five week, like, I guess, locked away period of time, a week later, it was, you know, locked down essentially. And we were just then locked down in our houses and we were just a bit like, oh God, like this is just even worse now because we just couldn't hang out and, you know, be a, and record music and, and do all those bits together. But yeah, it was it's really, um, yeah, like I said, like one of the most, um oh, what's the word like gratifying and fun times i've ever had of of being in a band i think being in the studio is one of my favorite things about being in a band so cool yeah, yeah. i think i think i really like the yeah the studio kind of vibe i love touring in terms of mm -hmm. i love seeing new places but it, it feels like a bit more well, it's more, well, it is more tiring. It is, it's hard work and, you know, you don't get much sleep, but yeah, the creative aspect of being in a studio is great. I've never done it for as long as you, as you have, to be honest, I've recorded a few albums over my time, but, um, I've never been locked away at one for like weeks on end. I think yeah. the mo most I did was like, we did a week in Rockfield, but oh, nice. because, because that was relatively close. I was coming home every night. So I didn't kind of have that locked away. Mm. Um, mm. and i think my um, straight lines did like i think we did a week in mono valley and i stayed a few nights but like it's because i've only i've always recorded local 
never yeah. gone so far away so i've never had that kind of experience but yeah it sounds amazing and it sounds like you timed it well just about just before the lockdown yeah so um at least you got it done then and mm. i guess you, you might have been in a different mindset if you'd recorded it all after because imagine like especially from maybe lucas's point of view more with lyrically like maybe his is his, his songwriting and lyrics may have turned out different if he knew this was going on in the world at the time so um I, yeah, I just you know, my, if it all be moved like two months later, just imagine how it would have been different. I don't know, but yeah, I can't wait to hear it myself. So it's out on the sixteenth of April. Um, I've been lucky enough to hear the new single in circles, which at the time of recording this podcast isn't out, but by the time it goes out, you'll be able to watch the video. Um, I presume it'll be on Spotify by then. Um, I haven't yeah. seen the video. Um, but I've heard the song and it's an absolute banger. It's a really cool kind of drum Thanks, groove, man. cool drum groove on it, uh, which I, th- it kind of reminded me of like Deftones kind of, Oh, sick. I don't know if that's a kind of, I don't know, just like the Abe from Deftones, man, he's got this way of like, he creates really interesting beats and mm. grooves that kind of just like, Again, it's that thing of I'm a drummer, so I'm listening to that. Maybe the average listener isn't, but it, it creates an interesting part of the song without kind of getting in the way of anything. Um, I don't know. That's what that's the first thing I thought of, but maybe I've got this kind of slightly uh, old fashioned uh, um, kind of library of bands in my head. I'm a little bit older than you. I'm 34, so I kind of I know Deftones are still like a big deal. They are still really relevant and stuff, but like. You know, yeah, uh, no, fully, man. That's that's yeah. really like it's very um it's really nice of you to say. Like yeah. again, like thank you for you no, know cool. being so kind <laughs> about the song. But um yeah, no, that's really um uh I guess you know, talking about Abe as like um and in terms of death tones, you know, the riffs and stuff in death tones music are so almost um they're not like I guess they're not like complicated, no, but they're they're like cool. And I think what makes Deftones as cool as they are is the little nuances that Abe adds to those grooves, you know, whether it's like a little like hi-hat on an upbeat, like yeah. an open close hi-hat or like a slight little off snare or slightly changing the kick pattern every, you know, every repetition. It's those cool things that make it groovy and cool. And I think makes their music a bit more um i don't know i guess like artsy might be the right yeah. word I'm not, I'm not sure but but yeah no um i think with within circles that's that's um almost like the, the complete opposite um lucas and scott wrote that first uh that like drum part that you hear um you know as like essentially like a loop that would that was um very like radio heads uh, sorry, Radiohead inspired, okay. um, and uh, they were like, "Yeah, we just want something that's is just ticking over and over and just keeps repeating." Um, that is, you know, that you know, the song is about kind of uh, people finding themselves in a in a constant sort of kind of like grey middle repetition, you know, like a like that loop of just going through the same notion every day and yeah. and just being like, "God, oh, you know, like." Uh, talking about the lyrics with Lucas last year you know him making a his like point was you know imagine life being so monotonous that you literally wake up and the first thing you hear is the hum of the sound of the earth that's the only thing that's like happening and you're like god that's the only thing I've noticed today you know like that same thing every day you know it's uh he's a fucking genius it's crazy like he's (laughs) genius talented um (laughs) Yeah, so like you're figuring out clever ways to to make that um, kind of replicate in the music, whether that's you know, a, yeah, in adopting like a pop style song structure or yeah. you know, repeating drum parts, um, and then again, you know, like taking things away. There's in the first kind of uh, verse of the song, there's like little like jam bo- blocks in the first verse that then kind of you know, I was like, oh, it's almost like. Um, I can't remember what, I don't know what they're called, but like the little, the things that you would use to like send signals like through, I can't remember what they're called. I'm not sure what they're called, but it's uh, it's like the things that send like SOS signals. 
Oh, okay. I'm not sure what they call. I'm not. I um, can't. Remember what I can't. Called. But the little things that you like tap and they look like tiny little staplers. <laughs> yeah, I don't know <laughs> like, the name. I don't know the names. I know what you mean though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so like those and 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 those little like there's like bits in the song that then you know completely disappear by verse two and it's just band then you know and um you know the outro like the instrumental like reprise but it being on a full kit as opposed to the kind of lo-fi kit that was in the first two verses and yeah like it was very um it's it's funny because it's such a i guess like simple song in terms of the structure and i guess the 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 musicality of the song but hmm. you know there's a lot with everything i guess there was a lot that sort of went into it thought wise and where to stop and bring back in drums you know um but yeah man, i'm fucking i'm ple- i'm so pleased that you dig it it's really yeah. nice to hear man i'm well, very grateful yeah well i'm going to listen to it again later with some headphones on cuz I just literally was, I was speaking to Ryan, by the way, when, for anyone who's listening, Ryan Richards from episode two and three, who's, who's a drummer in Funeral for a Friend, is the guy who manages Holden Absence, Future History Management. So, um, yeah, there's the link there. And I think they were mentioned in that episode. So if you haven't heard that episode, go and check it out with Ryan, because he's got some wicked stories. Um, mm. But yeah, it was literally like, maybe I think 30 minutes before we were due to start this. He was like, Oh, check out this track. I was like, Oh, I saw, I stuck it on quickly while I was having my lunch. And, um, but I, yeah, I haven't listened to it through speakers or headphones or anything yet. So that was just through my phone. It sounded banging. Mm. It was instantly like the the chorus is in my head now. So that's good. (laughs) So it's instantly like an anthemic kind of chorus to it. And, um, yeah, it just makes me want to go and check it out again. And yeah, but cool. Congratulations. But, um, Thanks, yeah it's great um talking about that well J- james is i speak to james every now and again and i i was a bit shocked when he announced he was leaving the band um obviously he's got his other project james and the cold gun which is is really amazing um the new song is really good kind of different different kind of vibe um was that a bit of a shock to you or did you see it come in or did he like I'm assuming you've obviously talked about it before you just announced it, I presume. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was a planned announcement and all that. Um, yeah. But is it like, is it gutting kind of having to find, well, just he's been in the band so long with yourself. Like, how do you feel about that? Yeah, man. So, you know, like James essentially like asked me to join Holden Absence, you know, right. so there's yeah. like a real, you know, like a, a big kind of like, um, there's a bond there, you know, like me and James have like a real like deep connection as friends. And he's one of my like closest friends. He's one of my like best friends. Um, We get along so well, you know, we have, we share a lot of the same views and, and opinions and, you know, things like that. Um, And uh, I, I I don't think I've really ever said like this, like to many people, but you know, like James, like heavily, like influenced my, uh my like sobriety and stuff and what made me be like oh you know what like i want to give this a go and sort of whenever i'd have those little bouts of like oh i you know gonna kick it i'd be like oh no you know what james is you know he's about three maybe four years younger than me and had been straight edge for i think like three or four years and i was like god bloody hell like he's Mm. so together so it was almost kind of like a I, you know, I look up to James with a lot of respect and, and love as, you know, as a friend and, and a person. So yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely hard hearing James say, oh, I'm, you know, not happy in the band. I, I'm thinking about leaving and, you know, again, like trying to sympathize with that. Oh, you know, why, why wouldn't someone want to continue being in the band? It's It's really hard to, to kind of gauge it when, you know, I guess had things been different and we were out touring, you know, he, he might not have been so susceptible to, to those like thoughts and feelings, but you know, he, yeah, he, true. Yeah. he he lives with the other, the other James in James and the cold gun and they'd been writing lots of songs together. So I think, yeah, it was, it was more for him to, it was it, it, within his best interests, you know, I don't want to talk too much for him, but it no, was, of course it was, not, yeah better for him to to do that and i guess focus on that than you know i guess worry about 
I don't even know if I could, if I have the right to say that, you know, Holden Absence is now this entity or whatever. It was, you know, it's definitely, it's bigger than, you know, the people that are in it. So whether that was kind of maybe a worry that he had and he was, you know, a bit um, tumultuous with that, I'm not sure. But yeah, I think, again, you know, the same thing with with Fez. You, you, I would hate for James to be unhappy in anything. So yeah. when he was like, I'm unhappy, it was just immediately like, well, like not i you know it wasn't like boot him out the door go on go you know no, but yeah. more like a if you want to go i you know completely understand completely support it and we'd had like lots of phone calls before he had said to he we'd, we'd brought it forward and said you know like oh, you know he sent an email and was like oh, i want to leave guys you know it was um we'd like confided about it quite a lot so yeah it was um as hard as it was like really you know okay and and fine really so but yeah that's cool it's good it was you know everyone's cool with it and mm. like like i i think a lot of people were probably just shocked because obviously we could see you, you you know you were on the rise you had a new album coming out and he was obviously part of the album so yeah i'm sure he'll have some form of well i'm sure he'll be proud when the record comes out and proud of you guys and uh, but i think he sounds like he's excited about what he can do with his his other project and um i guess it's a slightly different direction musically and stuff like that but um yeah all the best to him and um it's good to know that you're all cool with each other and you're still great mates so uh yeah I'm really man, glad, to hear, glad to hear that yeah um, and um talking about that he's he's actually performing in the afterlife video which was the previous single mm. on the album and that's a great song we've talked about the video is really cool but one of the coolest things I noticed about that video, I rewatched it last night. I didn't notice it the first time around. <laughs> you you actually kick your high hats, and it's so yeah, big like, boot, mate. It's so awesome. Is that, yeah, I was man. like, I've never seen anyone do that. Is that is that something you came up with, or did some, have you seen someone else do that? And it made you think, oh, I'm going to give that a go. Or was this? Oh man, it was. <laughs> it was. Um, I I can't remember if it was uh this fellow in particular basically um so rj hale who is the drummer for hailstorm he's yeah. like a like a wild card he's completely unhinged like he's like crazy and yeah i think like i've like i don't know if if, if anyone has had has seen hold an absence prior to maybe 2018 2019 like we were just like them like we were we were out to like be the maddest band like from south wales you know there's like videos of us from january 2017 playing at um saint pancras old church proper giving it the beans like you know it was we we were kind of i don't know it's just it's just so pent up and full of like just wanting to leather stuff that yeah i just i've always kind of had that like in me so like nice yeah the the old boot was just a a nice <laughs> get really really getting into the song on the day and giving it the giving it the beans as it were yeah, yeah that's cool yeah, just a good bit of fun mate that's pretty cool I'm, I'm gonna try it myself i don't think my leg goes up high enough but we'll see <laughs> <laughs> i have to do some more stretches and stuff like that but no man it's, yeah it's cool um yeah so um you've kind of mentioned it a little bit to me earlier but like after this album comes out obviously covid dependent what are the touring plans that are kind of set in stone uh so yeah uh, you know government dependent i guess so we've got a headline tour in october november um which is at the moment penciled in with yours truly who are an australian band and our friends from the uk wargasm and static dress um we're playing in cardiff uh london manchester glasgow i believe we're playing in sheffield and oxford um birmingham i may have missed a place that sounds about right that feels about right. i think we're playing in newcastle nice um so almost doing a full circuit we're just just missing the the south of of the uk um but yeah that's uh so that that's uh, i can't remember exactly when it is um but that's yeah right. we, we can post it up we'll post it october up yeah yeah cool october november and then december um i think finishing i think it's sort of mid-december um we'll be out again with uh creeper and orgasm and stack dress oh, nice. um, on creeper's headline tour 
um, and that is in Brighton, Leeds, Birmingham, Manchester, London, and Glasgow. Yeah, it's only six dates. So yeah, I've got that one right. That's I don't think that's the order, but those in those cities, yeah. People can Google so, it. Uh, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the. Uh, I, I was I, can't, I might have been chatting to my friend um, Natalie about this, but uh, she she was saying like, oh, why would someone pay more to see you on your headline tour than you know just come and see you with Creeper? And like as a, a like a you you might understand like as a band member, you're like, oh, what like because of our headline tour, we'll be playing more songs, we'll be playing for longer, we'll have like a bigger show. Yeah. She was like, yeah, but people could see all the good songs like at the Creeper tour. And I was like, they're all oh, good well, songs. They're all good songs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, yeah I th- but like to, you know, both tours are going to be probably, we'll have like way more chusper on the Creeper tour to give it the beans, you know, because we yeah. won't be playing for as long. So it'll be a bit more like, chaos hold an absence but the headline tour is kind of you know we we've been planning this now for well over a year we were scheduled to already have done this tour in november last year so um a lot of the things that we've got planned for this tour in particular are, are very they're very like special you know lots of things sort of at different shows are going to be uh i guess different you know when when the album comes out people might get a better gauge of kind of what i'm what i mean by like you know what in in cardiff we have like a quite like a, a big kind of um part sort of you know planned and yeah it's really nice. it's really like it's going to be really fun that tour i think stressful but uh, i love it mate Just get me yeah. back out there <laughs> get me un- get me unloading a van i know i can't I know. wait for it i can't wait i know <laughs> Uh, well, it is all. I must say, it is interesting seeing such a sin, similar lineup back to back. But I guess that's just the way mm. it's happened. Um, but like when when you're supporting another band, like your main goal is to get new fans from their fans. Yeah. Whereas your headline tour is the pressure is on you to pull the punters in. So yeah, you know, they, they they're bound to be some creeper fans that haven't heard you or seen you live. So. And that's the idea, isn't it? So and they're gonna they're gonna go away and they're gonna be like, God, my new favorite band. Exactly. I can't wait. That's they're gonna idea. be cr- they're gonna be the most crazy band they've ever seen. They're gonna be like, I can't believe that drum was kicking his eye hat all yeah. night. <laughs> they're not gonna believe it. <laughs> and um, yeah, as well, I was gonna say, because you are like the whole band is energetic, obviously watching your music videos, seeing you live, you you go for it, you hit hard. Do you <clears throat> do you do you have any kind of pre-show like warm-up or workout routines or anything like that to kind of keep you from not hurting yourself and stuff uh i, can't, um, I get too- like kind of so i have like a nice little um i feel like everyone does like you know what you you you'll have one as well like whether it's sort of an hour or half an hour or however long you know i have like a nice little um pre-show like routine i, I like to i like to practice every um before every show and it's it's very i feel like it's very different than say my pre if i'm going for a practice with the boys or i'm doing something at home it's it's very different um totally but this is like a i guess like a a nice way to sort of put kind of push it but i've I've been working on like a a kind of i don't want to say a a book necessarily but like an uh an like a guide or something to how i approach being on tour and being at home and being in a studio um i've been working on it now for like since since january to to kind of like just like how i like do things and you know in those sort of 17 years of playing drums how i've kind of adopted this kind of style i guess if it's if you know that's even a a word for how i i play like but like yeah i'm i'm kind of like you know this is these are things that i've like learned from you know people in in a studio saying oh so you know when i first started tracking drums it was in hold an absence you know i'd never been recorded before um and because i was so you know keen to play i was in my head it was play loud and play really hard but then it was only until you know a few sessions into the band they were like oh man you're hitting the cymbals so hard like come back from the cymbals but hit the drums you know really hard and i was like oh like I'd never, you know, I never been told that before, you know, so, but then, you know, at a show, 
I'm not playing the same way I play in a studio. The adrenaline's up, you know, there's, you know, people watching. I'm kind of like in a mix between don't mess up and just to have loads of fun and enjoy it, you know. So like I'm not practicing too much on hitting the cymbals super light that they sound great. I want to, you know, that's, you know, I'll let the front of house deal with that. Like I'm just going to have as much fun as I can. Um, Yeah, I have like a, but to go back to your question, yeah, I do have like a, a pre-show um kind of routine where i'll i always look i'll really try and get in like a, at least a 10 minute like walk as close as i can to playing so i'm like and i'm walking at like a quite a i guess like fast pace like a you know quite heavy i'm getting the heart rate up i'm trying to That's get my butt get my body used to moving you know and i want like lots of blood in my body as opposed to being sat down i'm just practicing you know, I want like my whole body to be like kind of not like pumped up, but, you know, like r- ready Red, for a show. Ready, yeah, so I'm, yeah, yeah and, and get all the blood moving and, and all that kind of stuff. And I do like little bits of tap in with, with sticks and stuff on a pad before that. But yeah, the, the one thing I've found is, is the most um, has time and time again helped me uh, is yeah doing a, a nice walk before I play it. It kind of like and it helps me like focus on the thing and you know the show that is about to you know happen. So it's yeah it's it's nice. It's kind of like a as much of an exercise for my body as as is an exercise for my mind. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Do you, what, do you mean you go walking like outdoors or just within the yeah. venue? Yeah. Oh, nice. Or, you know, depending on how, if it's a, yeah. a you know, like a festival or, or something like that, or, you know, like an indoor all day festival yeah, or whatever, just... I'll, I'll do like a lap or, or something, you know, enough, nice. uh, sort of enough, enough for my, yeah, to feel my heart rate going up and, and getting ready for, for the show. Yeah. That's great. Cause yeah. it's nothing worse. And I've done it a few times on maybe days where, you know when you you sometimes have guests around maybe before the show and and you kind of feel like you are you're obliged to kind of stick around and chat to them mm. and then you don't really get to kind of do your your normal routine and then you go on stage and you're kind of cold and I hate that and it takes yeah. a few songs to actually warm up yeah so it's it's great to have, that's a great idea and no? like I love going walking and do a bit of running myself and stuff like that so I never thought about going for a walk before a gig so maybe I'll give that a go and that that kind of book kind of guide idea sounds really interesting so we'll chat about that yeah man yeah, yeah I'm, sure. in, I'm interested in that that sounds really cool um well, one thing i've i've heard about your band and i've no i've noticed it online is that you're very 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 interactive with fans and i like i've heard that you spend hours outside a show chatting to your fans and stuff like that and which i think I think a lot of bands do that to some degree, but I think you take it to the next level by, by, by the sounds of it. Um, mm. um, I, I presume that really, you really notice that come back like with, with the fans retaining and kind of getting into the band because they feel like you've given them time and stuff like that. And like, are there any kind of um, particular moments you like really remember that you kind of thought, wow, this is like, this is amazing. These people come and see us. Mm. maybe you've made friends with fans or or just met fans i think i just think that's one thing that's really unique that other bands don't do to your degree and i think maybe that helps kind of retain that those fans you know yeah yeah i think like you you can attest to this you know like without like people that support the band like the the band is like as much of like uh, is I don't know it's it's hard to kind of articulate without sounding like uh, like I feel like I sound a bit lame when I'm like without fans a band is like a hobby so like it's yeah. when you have it's like a business you know a business isn't a business without custom I guess you know you've got like a thing that you want to sell to people unless you have people coming to buy your thing you're just like a person with things to sell you know so like in and you know again like I, I don't want that to sound like our fans are our customers because like that's i even calling people that support the band fans i'm like i yeah. i'm like uh, you know like these people are like friends you know to a lot of us we know a lot of the people that come to our shows by name you know we there are like so many recognizable faces and and every person that you know wants to 
chat or message us or, or whatever it is like whether that's on socials or or at shows it's you know I, we we take a lot of pride in in knowing those people and talking with those people because you know essentially without th- these people you know we're just four fellas that love yeah. playing post hardcore music you know so it's um and again a testament to the mindset of being like i just want to do the band you know this this was never the goal the the maybe the goal was to record an album but you know the 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 fella that you know was playing drums in my parents conservatory was that person you know so to think god if if any if there's anyone out there whose favorite band is holding absence you know and and we can to you know the amount of time and and to even say you know hold an absence is someone's favorite band is like it's huge you know like yeah. that's un, that's unreal to to like me and us so yeah of course you know you, you want to make time for those people and you want to get to know them and you want to like be as you know friendly and as nice as you can and makes all the time in the world for them because they're the most important part of of i feel like being in a band you know when when you know you've got x amount of plays on spotify or you've sold x amount of albums you know that's great but again like i think for me like going to a show and seeing people at your show i think the most um unreal outer body experience for me was when we played the very last show um that we had played you know in 2019 at scala i'd never been to scala i wasn't sure how big it was and you know, we we saw people like lining up down the side of the venue. I was like, I like, I you know, I was stood opposite, like on a road a little further away, and I just started crying because I was like, <sighs> holy shit! Like, how did this many people want to come and see us? You know, it was it was like I couldn't figure it out. You know, it yeah. was and it was it was so overwhelming. Yeah, it was like pride and joy and like, ju- yeah, it was this this weird overwhelming feeling um but then you know it was raining after the show and i just remember being like I, whoever is outside i need i just want to thank all of them for coming like i need to go and talk to them and chat with them and you know i think we spent like an hour and a half two hours talking to people outside just because you know that was like the biggest show headline show we'd ever played it was such a special moment for us that you know those people that we spoke to if they could go away and, and be like wow that was such a special night for them yeah exactly like you know cl- close sign on the door job done you know that was it perfect like if everyone goes away from our shows feeling a little bit closer to our band and our music that's like that's just the most satisfying thing i think we could achieve as as musicians really oh, awesome man so, that's so great to hear that kind of um that kind of aspect on it because there's so many bands i've seen literally you know in that similar situation they'd literally try and go out of their way to avoid any contact with with the fans and i'm like like that's not the way to go about it like i i I try my best within logistical reasons if if there's time obviously um or even before shows i try i try and do it um when I can, but like you guys take mm-hmm. it to another level. So that, no, it's really cool. And I'm sure everyone does appreciate that. And um, yeah, they feel like they're part, part of the, the, the family of the band. Yeah. I guess that's how you feel. Um, so um, yeah, we're c- coming towards the end now. Um, I wanted to kind of mention that I, I read about that. You had a US tour booked. I think that was, yeah. two, maybe that was 2019. I, I forget. Um and you couldn't go because your visas or one of your visas got denied or whatever like that. Um, and it was a, mm-hmm. it was the same year that it happened to a few other bands. Um, there was a band, I, I don't know if you're familiar with orange goblin, something similar yes. ha- happened to them around the similar mm-hmm. time period. And it's just kind of like, is that, is that, is that put you off at all from applying to do a U.S. tour in the future? Because it, it costs oh. you money, right? You lost money. Yeah. That like thousands, like so much money. It was yeah. crazy, but uh, no, nah man as soon as we can like get out there we 100 percent like um again like going back to what we're saying about the next thing you know we've you've been a band now for i guess deducting the year that we had taken from covid like four years you know four years now four and a half years so i think 
touring the UK and Europe now. We've we've done it a lot, and I think that feeling of of doing something again for the first time is going to be like overwhelming. You know, it's going to be like you know, like I've always I think recording an album has always been like such a high thing on my bucket list but getting on a plane and going to play a show like I can't even like fathom how that would feel you know mm. and I, I just think it would be like peak like ah oh, bloody hell you know like peak like this is this is amazing um so yeah when the when the America thing happened it was just like we had found out a, a few weeks before sort of we'd been able to say or maybe a week or two before we'd been able to say oh yeah we're not going so you know I, I think we'd got our the confirmation that we weren't going um quite early like in the not even early in the morning like or late at night like 2 a.m mm. um and i'd fallen asleep like with my phone like this on me and i woke <laughs> up and i quickly checked my phone and it was like oh i'm really sorry boys like we're not going and i just like got up and i like, just cried for like an hour because i was like oh bloody hell i was so set on going yeah yeah but, um was- it was just i was yeah just absolutely livid livid but um if if, mate testament to that you know the next day was when we all met up together and we were like let's record gravity and birdcage and put those songs out to be like even though we can't like let's let's take control of the situation and do something you know we want to you know we deserve that we deserve to be able to take you know the the control of the band back essentially and yeah. you know because in that instance it was just down to someone saying yes or no you know that was just their job to be like well no they can't come and you know the yeah sorry did you get any like information as to why you weren't allowed no i'm not sure i i no. No. yeah just a X. nice yeah <laughs> man and it like, it's crazy they're like yeah, that's crazy. just in someone's power and you know like it would have been like a, a six weekish tour i think it was oh, mad man. it was so so great but yeah i think just just it, more than anything it just really helped us be like fire under the ass like we're not having this like let's go record you know two songs and the next time we get that offer like hopefully now that the american politics are a little bit different you yeah. know it might be a bit easier for us to get over next time and yeah. whenever okay. whenever that may be yeah, yeah just cool. uh Fingers just crossed. so keen for it mate so keen for it any right. plane ride anywhere any plane, plane anywhere yeah i know yeah. Yeah, a, i know i used to hate flying but like i do anything to get on a plane right now to go somewhere yeah, I know. even yeah. though even if i had to wear a mask i'd do it it's fine <laughs> <laughs> but, um so uh, like we've done this whole podcast we haven't even talked about what gear you use what what gear <sighs> are you using at the moment oh um a lot well not a lot i yeah. guess um <laughs> So it's man like sort of on tangent but a bit off tangent i've like I've, i want to do like a nice gear rundown video like i've always wanted to do one yeah, i love looking it, up drummers and being like god you know they use this this and this and like i'd love i'd really love it mate it'd be so good i might i might have to have a, a go but um yeah, yeah i guess um so i uh oh, talking about america i can kind of interlace this together when we were like you know booked to go out there i bought a snare drum in um california and i was like gonna pick it up like when i was out there and then bring it back and you know i was like i was gassed it was like a it, so it was like a d dw collectors like brass snare drum and it cost me like 800 dollars or something and i was yeah. like i'm gonna go i'm gonna take an empty flight case out because it won't weigh as much and then i'll bring it you know fly it back and and then it sat there for like it sat in one of my friend's apartments in la for like six months until a friend of mine, Brady, who was in the band Conjurer, was like, oh, I'm in LA now. I'll bring it back. So the the first time I got to play the snare drum was recording the the album, the new album. Oh nice. Uh, yeah, mate. So I couldn't couldn't have been couldn't have been happier really. But uh yeah, that's my like my now main uh go to snare for everything. It's it's unreal. It's so nice. I think it's one of the like I'm very like not um uh, I don't know what the right word is, but like, I don't like look at th- my things and go like, I really, you know, like I don't have a car. I don't have like an expense. I don't like own a house or anything, but like the one thing I do have is like, you know, some nice gear is like, yeah. So I've got, um, yeah, a nice, a nice DW snare. Uh, I play, um, Zildjian cymbals, which is like a, 
again, mad that the fella in a band from, you know, lives in Wollaston is now like a, plays Zildjian cymbals. Like it, it's always yeah. been like a, a dream really to play like cymbals by Zildjian. You know, I remember buying my first ever cymbal was a, an 18 inch uh, rock crash. Oh yeah. Um, a Vedas one. And uh, so yeah, I play, yeah, those and I'm like gassed. Like I get to be a Zildjian as a gen artist, as it were. That is um, cool, man. That's really cool. Uh, I, I have like DW hardware. It's the only hardware that like will not fall over when I'm lamping everything. Um, <laughs> it is good hardware, to be fair. And then a, a massive uh, D drum drum kit, which is uh, forty. Because uh, I've caught, I've I remember you posting about a fourteen inch rack tom, mate. Yeah. I was like, yep, that's the way. <laughs> uh, a big old, big old fourteen inch rack tom, and then sixteen, eighteen, and a twenty six by fifteen kick. So big oh, old, wow. yeah, big old, big old boys, big old boys. So two floor mm-hmm. toms, one up, two down. Yeah, that's without the twenty six. My new kit has got a sixteen and eighteen floor, but only a thirteen <laughs> rack because they don't. Ah, mate. Cut in. Ah, uh, mate. Nah, perfect. Or twenty-four um, kick. Get a big old fourteen-inch rack, Tom, and just just plonk that on a on a snare stand. Yeah, mate. that'd be the way. <laughs> I've got my old one, my white one, like. But yeah, no, it's yeah. good. It's good. Um, it's kind of cool that those big sizes are coming back into kind of fashion. Because I remember, like when I was young, it was all about small fusion sizes and stuff. Oh uh, yeah. And I'm like, and like the short toms, you know what I mean? They were like yeah, hy- yeah. Hyper, were they hypers? I don't mm. know, where they whatever they called them. And um, but now it's kind of like. It's kind of cool again to have big, massive toms. And like, like my influence, I don't know about you, was like, would, would have been like Dave Grohl. Yeah. Watch his Nirvana videos. I think he, he was famous for playing this Tama kit. I forget the, the model, but like, yeah, 14 inch um, Tom. I think it was 18 inch floor or something like that. And it's just like, so, that's just like the ideal sound everyone wants in a rock. Yeah. Movie, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Huge. That's huge. Cool. Is it what, what stick, think... sticks are you using? Uh, I I've like played um I've like tried a lot of the you know different brands and stuff but Pro Mark are like oh, cool. I feel like they're like made for the you know the the style that I play um I used to play 2B but um it was like a it just eight symbols it was yeah. just too like yeah and then I think when I um when I ended up uh cracking my one of my like uh i i bought like a k light ride a 24 inch k light ride and uh nice. they're like you know the nicest you know they're fucking so spenny and uh i ended up cracking it like after like four months and i was like oh what do i do and then everyone was just like man just play smaller sticks and i was like all right i'll give it a go so now i play like i just play 5b and it's yeah i can still absolutely wallop everything but and there's a little bit more like control in the in the softer stuff as well, you know, in like like little intricacies that I can kind of do that. Otherwise, with a two B or a bit like clunky, you know. Yeah, yeah. I like I've never tried to play a show with two Bs, but like I've been given some before, and I just felt like these feel huge. Mm. I just don't know how I'd be able to play my the way I play with them. Yeah, um, but I guess you get used to you get used to stuff. One one of the, my other episodes with Mickey D. He uses two Bs and I use five Bs. And he was yeah. like, I use sticks like yours for, to eat Chinese food with. <laughs> He's going to have to. <laughs> like I'm five, like five Bs are still pretty chunky, you know, they're pretty chunky compared to. Like, I can one up uh, Mickey D. So Promark do a two, <laughs> a, a two S, which is like thicker than a two B. And uh, it's like it's like a baseball bat, and oh I used God. it for I used it for a tour. I used it for one tour, and uh, I ended up. I think I broke every symbol on that tour just yeah, because they were just huge. They're like they're an X. They're almost an extra three quarters of an inch, so it's like almost seventeen inches, and it's like the thickest thickest diameter that like Promark sell. And I was just like, bloody hell, these are these are brilliant for trying to keep people away from your drums but not good for drums they make drums sound great but they're just yeah. so heavy mate they're like yeah. wild so uh yeah. get a pair and then play with them for a bit and then get mickey d back on and be like right fella right yeah i got some t- have you ever tried these two s's and he's just like that what they're just massive they're like jars <laughs> oh man i just want to buy a pair just to try them out oh god where they're like but yeah it's, it's it, the end of the day yeah, I know. Like, if you, if you're indoors, they probably replace your symbols, right? But like, mm. 
still a pain when you're in the middle of a tour and one goes and you can't really go in for another couple of days or next week or I don't know how fast they are depending on where you are in the world. But um, yeah, I, I hate if I crack a symbol. I bloody hate it. It's the worst thing ever. I hate yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't done it that much, but it did happen. I cracked like two on the same tour once. Um, I was in the middle of Europe when they were like, I can't get one out. Well, I think they got one out to me. But I had to play some broken ones for a couple of nights and it just sounded crap. <laughs> but now I, nice. what, what I've learned from that experience now, I've actually forked out and I bought it. I know it, it cost me a few hundred quid, but I, I bought a spare set. So if any, oh, nice. So like if any of my main ones break on tour, I can replace it with someone, something equally as good. Yeah. Right? Until I can kind of get a replacement and stuff, but mm. it's just good. It was just it just wasn't fun playing for nights on end with broken cymbals. Yeah, I mean, uh, man, I done like I think in the early days, like I just uh, we just played tour. I just played tours with you know broken cymbals. Yeah. I think before before my first cymbal, like actual endorsement, I um uh we played a show in Sin City in Swansea. Yeah, yeah. And uh Rico came up to me like after the show and he was like, Duh, bloody hell man. Sounds like you're written bin lids. I was like, oh because <laughs> they were just <laughs> both like cracked beyond belief. Like, but yeah, and then I think the the next year, uh two or three days later when we did downloads, there were like some nice big new pies for me, which was which was yeah. a nice treat. But yeah, it was bloody mate for for years like I, th- I think that's probably like why i'm just like ah oh, i just hit the symbols as hard as i can because i've just played like or you know for for the best part of a year year and a half i just most of my symbols because we were playing shows so much in pubs and that they, yeah it does make a difference it just that's what i could go off so it's, it's almost weird having nice you know new sim- like nice uncracked sounding gorgeous symbols you know it's, yeah. it's his right street very lucky boy yeah and they're really they're actually satisfying to play mm. when they're when they're nice and uncracked but as soon as like it only needs to be like half a centimeter and they just sound like get, yeah you know, sound like balls but uh um, mm. nice 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 to hear about that and um yeah i'll uh i well hope i haven't actually checked our tour dates with yours but if i can come to your cardiff show i will definitely try and make it but i'm on tour with member as well so i don't know when oh, fair. whether they overlap or not i haven't i'll have to check but that'd be cool oh yeah man if you're free just just there's that mate we'll chuck you on the old chuck you on the door now oh sort you out a nice very, spot mate yeah very kind of you very kind of you yeah, mate. um one thing i've introduced quick 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 fire round before we finish um just so people did get can get to know you a little bit more um, great hit me a little bit of fun what's your favorite hot or cold weather what's my what sorry y- y- your favorite out of hot or cold weather oh sorry i thought you said what's your favorite hot dog weather oh, I was right. like, I don't know. Sorry. my accent <laughs> hot, or, man. hot or cold weather. um i would probably say cold by instinct because i like big coats but i oh. i'm enjoying the sun at the minute you know i'm enjoying the sun yeah that's fair enough i'm uh, yeah i feel the cold a lot so i like i like it when it's warm uh daytime or nighttime uh nighttime no way more productive in the nighttime interesting interesting sweet or savory ah uh, savory salt salted popcorn uh 100 uh, that's my like go-to snack yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay uh, guitar or bass uh bass because i can i can't play guitar okay cool i'm a bass man as well mm. um we haven't talked about this nylon or wood tip drumsticks a wood tip cool yeah. <laughs> john bonham or neil peart if any um i feel like my kit probably would you know just john bonham even yeah. though i don't really i'm not really either i couldn't really tell you which one i prefer but i think i probably would prefer john bonham yeah i think so as well well your, yeah. your kit yeah especially with your setup um yeah. Beatles or Rolling Stones? Uh, probably, I would say I've heard more Rolling Stones songs, but I think I've only heard two. <laughs> oh, right, okay. So yeah. n- n- neither then. Neither, yeah. Oh, man, you got to listen to the Beatles, man. You are getting. I know. Getting, yeah. you're, on, you're on Spotify now. It'll blow your mind. I, I, hadn't, right. I hadn't really listened to the Beatles myself until, mm-hmm. until I was like maybe early 20s, 23. Like I heard, obviously some of the big songs, but I never listened to an album, and then it blew my mind. I was okay. like, honestly, it's really, it's really inspiring. Um, All right, Rolling on your Stone, recommendation, yeah, I'll go, I'll go listen to some Beatles after this. Go listen to Sergeant Pepper, 
that album, right. and you'll be like, wow. Um, okay. I think you'll like it. Let me know. Um, clear or coated drum heads? I haven't asked you about drum heads. Uh, I play like coated. I like yeah. coated a lot more. Yeah, I, I um I play with um an Emperor X on my snare because it's the thickest one that Remo make yeah. for snare heads. Um, yeah. and the coated Power Stroke Four with the little ring inside. I know. I, know I can one. make them. Yeah, I, I sort of get like at least sort of four to six months of playing and sh- and tours out of out of those so they're like oh, wow, perfect yeah. for me but but clear clear um kick heads i really like clear kick heads okay mm. yeah i think that's quite normal i think yeah cool. mm-hmm. I, I prefer coated on my toms as well uh, yeah. big or small venues uh small floor shows um as close to the people as i can get i love looking up and being like oh, all right everyone you know i, 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 had, a, I had a feeling you'd, you'd say something like that i don't know i just yeah. thought, i thought yeah um favorite time signature to play um four four is boring isn't it i mean it's not boring well, it's, it's just everyone's so standard four, four. but, I, but everyone's I guess like that yeah i guess that we have like one song that's in three four which is oh, really cool. fun to play. Wilt is in three four. Um, cool. I really want to write a song in five four. I really there's a there's a fantastic thrice song um, called I think it's called Beyond the Pines, um, and it's in five four. But it's so like the pinnacle of five four where it feels like four. It's so right. great. I'll listen to Sergeant Pepper if you go and listen to this thrice will, song, yeah. mate. Okay, yeah, it's unreal. The fill going in before the drums come in is like it's pure taste is so great yeah i'll send that you sounds, it that sounds good yeah um because mm. i've been listening to something someone talk about odd time signatures like that and they say the genius is to make it feel like it's not in an odd time signature which so- it sounds yeah. like that's what you mean so yeah you can actually still bob mm-hmm. your head it's, it's where they actually kind of put the accents and and the, yeah so i'll listen to that honestly yeah because Thrice is, is one of those bands where all of my friends and people growing up loved them. I just never quite got around to listening to them properly. And I'm sure yeah. they're geniuses because everyone else like, seems uh, to think they are. <laughs> yeah, man, that song is like the perfect gateway into Thrice, I think. Okay. Like, you'll probably listen to it and be like, wow, like the vocals are like just oozing with like charisma and like Justin's like, the, he's such a great vocalist. And then, yeah, Riley is like really a really tasteful drummer. So I think you'd really, yeah, you'd really dig it okay cool thanks man yeah i'll send you that um but just to end then everyone has to answer this question so if you could start your own dream band uh with yourself on drums with any musicians dead or alive who would you want on the other uh, other instruments not including members of holding absence okay so you uh, get excused. Uh, oh um I would have to probably so I'm not actually very like familiar with uh Dillinger Escape Plan or Chariot, but like I would probably choose someone from one of those. Actually, I think um Stevis, who plays in Fever 333, he was in Dillinger or Chariot. So I'd probably say him who's okay. in Stevis from Fever 333, uh on guitar or bass or whatever he played in the other band he was right. in. Um, yeah. Yes, he's mad. And probably Jason Alon Butler, who is also in the Fever three three three, but was in Let Live. Um, and I'd like I'd like poke him and be like, Can we do a bit more like Let Live style? Because <laughs> uh, he was like that's like where I think early HA got like the influence of, you know, kind of craziness from was was Let Live. Um okay. I think uh, another guitar another guitar should we have another guitar yeah let's do another guitar yeah, um well. maybe well i might i'm gonna say fez because fez isn't in hold and absence anymore good point. and i'd have him on guitar because he's a great guitarist and he's like big big naughty boy he's like a proper like <laughs> he was he was the reason we were like a couple of naughty boys like on tour screaming at each other and ah, like going mad so i'd have fez on guitar um i'd have james on bass again oh yeah yeah <laughs> i'd get him back in out of the cold gun and into the hot water <laughs> um yeah god what a weird band jason butler and james joseph <laughs> um cool, yeah and then and then me on drums i guess 
you could join if you wanted. You could we could play like we could have like a club kit. Like oh. you could play like a normal drum kit and I'll play like a stood up drum kit so I can like run around oh, and be like cool. be mad. Just like running with drums over my head, like, oh come on, everyone in the small venues. Like that'd be great. That sounds cool. I'd love man. that. Yeah. That'd be <laughs> awesome. I've uh, recently um heard about I think they call it shedding. And mm. it might be more of an American thing when like a couple of drummers get into a room with their own drum kit and kind of jam with oh. them. I've never done that. Yeah, before. mate. So I think, mate, that... no, neither have I. Like a lot of people, I like a couple of guys from like, yeah, like Cardiff, where like uh, Sai, who plays in Junior and Novo and more. Oh, he, right. um, he was like, oh man, I'd love to do this. And I've got like, you know, a couple of the friends, um, Spencer, who plays drums for James and the Cold Gun. You know, we've always been like, oh, it'd be so good, you know, to do stuff like that. Um, yeah 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 dude i'd love i'd love to it's just it's just one of those things isn't it like it's not like you can just take an acoustic guitar around your friend's house and just play in the living room it's like you gotta have a big enough room to accommodate uh, drum kits and like it's not just right. one now it's not just one loud drum kit it's a couple of them you know? exactly yeah so it is yeah it's, it's tricky and obviously it's, everyone needs transport and to get a gear and stuff but yeah it's something like i think after so long of not being able to play acoustic drums for so long and stuff like that i'm like like luckily i've got an electric kit i can play at home mm. I'm really grateful to have but yeah. i just want to play acoustic drums man so, uh, yeah dude yeah this when this is all when this is all over we'll get a couple of boys down music box and yeah, we'll yeah, just get yeah. the, get get all the drum kits out i'd i'd love it mate yeah. i'd love it no it'd be cool if anything like that happens like count me in or and it'd be great yeah. to meet some of those other guys because i don't think i've really been introduced to them properly so um that would be cool but yeah thanks yeah, for taking the man. time Time, right, anytime time for doing this and um i can't wait to hear the new album and i'm sure it's going to do really well and you know fingers crossed you can kind of hopefully get in the charts let's hope let's hope oh, go on. i really let's hope, hope so. so that'd be nice a little couple we'll get a couple pre-orders i'll see if we can get some pre-order codes for the poddy from ryan and be like oh can we just get everyone from drum for the song a little discount or something a little code yeah. that we can use from the podcast like right if there's any, obviously if there's anything like that guys I'll, I'll i'll put it out there to you but um they're they're a generous bunch i'm sure they'll go and buy it anyway <laughs> and or they, they'll definitely check you out and um yeah but basically yeah it's awesome it's really nice to like probably meet you and uh catch up and uh i'll go and listen to that song message me what it's called because I, I oh yeah i've instantly forgot what it's called yeah i will i'll send you a little link a song and uh yeah cheers man and um yeah man. good luck with the album and and the future touring mm -hmm. plans and hopefully you'll get the tour america and buy another snare drum <laughs> <laughs> the dream the only dream just the buying only... drums and traveling the world yeah man that'd be great now <laughs> cheers man it's been great so thanks, uh, up, brother thanks Speaking yeah thank you. you for having me brother oh no problem my pleasure great cheers guys thanks for listening Run for the Show podcast. I hope you really enjoyed that episode with Ash. I really did, as you could tell by listening. But yeah, check out Holding Absence. Check out the new album. Go see him on tour if you like what you hear. I can guarantee you'll love their energetic show. Support British bands. If this is your first episode of Drum for the Song, please consider subscribing on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. To keep up to date with any new episodes. If you're on Apple or anywhere that allows reviews, please leave me a review as it really helps other people find this podcast. Please follow me on social media. I'm on Instagram and Twitter as Dane underscore drums and drum for the song. I'm also on TikTok as drum for the song. Or if you're on Facebook, you can follow me on Dane Campbell Drummer or you can join the Drum for the Song official Facebook group. The group's really fun, and we talk about drums, and we talk about the episodes, and there's lots of memes and stupid things like that, and drummer jokes, so it's really good to get involved in all that kind of stuff. And as mentioned earlier, you can consider supporting me on patreon.com forward slash drum for the song. Your monthly donation really helps and goes towards keeping this podcast going. And you can get bonus episodes, video calls with me, loads of other cool stuff. There's a 20% discount on Motorhead beer and monthly competitions and loads of cool stuff. So, um, yeah, go and check that out. It really helped me out. If you know any drummers 
please share this podcast with them. The more drummers that find this podcast, the easier I can keep it going and the more worthwhile it will feel for me. Um, but yeah, it's great. And if you know any drummers in, in bands that you think might want to be on, get in touch. Or if there are any drummers you'd like me to try and get on, please let me know. And I'll do my best. But I'm not inhuman. Um, I think that's about it for today. I really hope you enjoyed. Thanks for listening this far. Check out the other episodes. And I'll see you next time. And if you're a drummer, don't forget to drum for the song. <laughs>